Hello, everybody, and welcome to another show of Effed Up Stories. My name is Will Pender. I'm your host, and uh, my co-host, Ryan Sharp, is here with me. Hi, everybody. Great to be back. Yeah, so we were on a, a hiatus here for a little while. Uh, we haven't posted any new shows for a couple of months. Um, honestly, we didn't think anybody noticed, <laughs> but apparently you have. So uh, in this episode, uh, we're going to talk about the Baltic Sea UFO um, which Sometimes is, referred to as the Baltic Sea Anomaly. Yeah, it's, it's kind of tagged as a nicknamed, um, and you'll see why when we get to the details. Um, but the subject was actually requested by our listener, Dane Merck, and he also sent us some links uh, to videos and articles that uh, you know got us started and on the way. But before we get into that, uh, we noticed kind of a spike in interest in our show um, which is actually what got us back here right now because we were, like I said, uh, kind of taking a break. And uh, we see that you've all left some comments, stuff like that. Uh, we, we asked you to do so, so we're going to answer some of your questions, actually. We're going to have a communique with you. And uh, we will also, we have a story uh, that was sent in to us by someone that we would like to tell and then once we've gotten all of that out of the way we will get to the Baltic Sea UFO so uh, with that said we're gonna start with the comments um, first of all we're very flattered and uh, I think I think we can speak I can speak for both of us to say that you oh, know most certainly uh, since the videos went up obviously uh, uh, we go back and look every now and then and um, well, there's been a sudden spike in, in viewers and comments, and uh, well, we just uh, want to say thanks to everybody who took the time to listen, and um, I apologize for saying and um a lot, a lot, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, me too. And the ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, and the stutter. Uh, the truth is, um, we're, some somehow, some people... And this is not just from the comments, but, uh, you know, a couple of questions I've gotten from people who've submitted stories and stuff like that. It's, it seems like people are under the impression that this is some kind of... Um, Produced uh, show. Yeah, like like this, it, that it's more than it is. Well, you know, just, just to, to reiterate what this actually is, we're just two guys who have an interest in the paranormal... Uh, we keep in touch. We don't even live in the same province, actually. Uh, Ryan's home right now uh, for a visit, but we keep in touch, and we generally, you know, we compare notes with shit that we find on the internet that we, we found interesting or stuff we've come across. And I was in a web development course, and it just occurred to me one day, you know, like, uh, maybe we should, you know, it'd be interesting to make a show, uh, a podcast. Like, I'll make a website. Um, you know, I'm a recording artist too. It was easy for me to throw all the art and stuff together. Uh, very easy to throw together. So this is not, we don't have a budget. We don't get paid. Um, you know, it, it's off the cuff. We don't have a teleprompter. We, you know, we have a couple of jot notes that we take for shit when we research it. But this is all off the cuff. That's why you hear ah and ums, because we can't remember what the hell we're talking about. We're trying to, to link to the next part of the story while we're thinking on the spot, <laughs> right? It's like jazz. It's improvision. Um, so with that said, we'll jump to a couple of these comments here, um, generally the ones that have some kind of merit. <laughs> so someone that actually asks us a, a question more so than just uh, a typical asshole insult. Um, not that it's entirely bad, though, because, I mean, that's that's the surefire way to know that people are listening, right? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's a fucking YouTube video if you don't have a couple of flocks, flocks of assholes leaving a couple comments? That That's the, the, the noticing sign that, hey, people are watching. Because every fucking video I find that's any good... Has a troll. You, well, not just a troll. It's, it's mostly fucking, like, there's like a flock of assholes that you'll see kind of spittered without the, uh, the line of comments there. And then you'll have some good ones, too. So so for those of you who uh, took the time to actually set down a intelligible comment, thank you very much. Uh, for everyone else, get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll start with on a comment for uh, our Kim Kale... Uh, the, Chemtrail conspiracy video. Uh, we only have one comment here for that. That's from Athraxius. Uh, that's his screen name. He says, uh, why you no make more shows? <laughs> well, 
we uh, we were on a hiatus. Essentially, what had happened was uh, I was in school. I finished um, up in what late June. Yeah, late June, and you know I, I promised myself I'd take some relaxation time, and I ended up uh, recording an album. So I didn't relax much at all. <laughs> uh, Ryan, I think, wanted a break as well. That and I really don't have the uh, the equipment um, and the uh, capability to produce something like this on my own. Um, you know, pretty much without will, this isn't a show. Um, just uh, I'd just be a windbag with a microphone. Yeah, basically, uh, the, the fact that we can do this is just by chance that I have gear from being a recording artist, and it just I can use this as well, and I have experience with. You know, art, websites, video. Um, so just a reminder, we have uh, absolutely no budget and any uh, um, sound quality issues. I'll apologize uh, up front as I don't own uh, a very good sound equipment. Uh, but I guess we'll move on to uh, the next comments here. Um, so our extreme paranormal. Uh, at Skinwalker Ranch Part 2. So th this, this video had uh, quite a few comments on here. Uh, starting at the bottom, we got Pool Pig asks, how often do you do shows? Well, uh, originally we did them once a week. That was uh, originally the goal. And honestly, you know, when, when we took a break, we didn't even think anyone would notice. We didn't think anyone actually watched this stuff. Um, we kind of put it out as our own personal amusement. And uh, it, was, it was over, you know, when we were on a break, more or less, that we noticed the spike in interest and uh that's kind of what and not that we wouldn't have done another show but it's what got us back doing it i can't promise that we're going to do a whole bunch this summer because like i said i'm writing an album uh ryan's home on vacation and we just bought a whole bunch of steam games on sale <laughs> so to answer your question pull pig we'll do them as often as uh, we possibly can um and that's, I guess, the best answer we can uh, we, we can give at this time. So I guess we'll move on to uh, freaking J six six six. And uh, you know what? This this comment actually made me laugh when I when I first read it. Uh, this guy stuttering is melting my brain. It's driving me nuts. And I think what what really made me laugh about it is he's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. No, uh, we are far from professional speakers. Uh, and as Will mentioned earlier, we, earlier, we do not have teleprompters. Uh, and more or less, uh, this show was born out of um, the fact that Will and I have about uh, once a week have uh, two-hour phone conversations about these topics. And we thought, you know what? Um, a lot of the things we touch on are pretty interesting. And uh, why don't we just record these conversations and, and, and see if anybody enjoys? So, um, yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, my stuttering uh, does drive me nuts as well. And, and the funny thing about it is, is that I don't normally stutter at all, right? <laughs> it's only when I'm doing these episodes, and I think it's because I'm, for one, I'm self-conscious of the fact that like it's being recorded. But for two, it's you know when you're talking about something, you forget what you're saying. Well, if I don't fucking stutter, it's like a it's like a gateway to get to the next part. Right? It's like otherwise there'd just be this big silence as I'm trying to, like, my brain's melting trying to think of the next thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, and, you know, for that matter, when it comes to professionalism, because, like I said, we really aren't, it, it sounds good because I got good gear. Uh, but, I mean, the truth is, we could do a professional fucking show. We could do it. But unless you're going to pay for it so that we can not go to work and do other things. You know, we, we, we really can't do that, right? Like, I just don't have the time. And that's just a fact of life. So, moving on, we got Commander Bubba. Uh, I enjoyed the discussion, so just consider this feedback and not a put-down. But the guy that keeps backing away from the microphone makes it sound like a very amateur production. Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize for backing away from the microphone, but, uh, yeah, um... I, I I I remember the episode. I can't remember what was happening, but it was uh, necessary. Uh, <laughs> it needed to be done. Yeah. Uh, um, however, I'll, in the future, I will endeavor to stay glued to my cheap headset microphone. Yeah. There we go. Okay. And moving on, we got 
King Mac Attack 42, so I'm guessing a McDonald's fan. Mac Attack? Perhaps. Mac Attack, okay. So uh, he says, Society has been fooled into believing that the teachings of the Bible are irrelevant and false, so that when things like this occur, the large part of humanity will not be able to make an accurate assumption as to what is happening and uh, be at a loss of making the correct identification of entities involved. Get people to abandon their belief in the devil, demons, or God for that matter. And replace it with a belief in aliens or transcendent evolved spirit masters. So what's your take on that, Ryan? Um, well, I think that that's a, a in, in the world of UFOlogy and uh, paranormal studies, um, where we're going to have to be open-minded people. There's professionalism for you folks. A uh, phone ringing. A uh, phone ringing in the background. <laughs> um I think that it's important to uh, keep an open mind on all uh, uh, sides of the fence. And while I uh, don't personally believe that extraterrestrial, or what we call extraterrestrial visitation, uh, are you know demons, um, perhaps the 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 whole spectrum of phenomena is that uh, isn't that different. That we have extra dimensional entities or um extraterrestrial entities that could either be mistaken for angelic or demonic beings um, well, i mean the, the, it's really wide open there I, I think i guess in a nutshell is that we could have many different things uh many different uh ways to explain different things that could all possibly be the same thing uh moving on to more comments here we have for our episode uh skinwalker ranch part 1 so th this video was fairly popular at least for us i mean i know you guys are looking at it you're seeing numbers like four thousand whatever views like big fucking deal i guess it's a big fucking deal to some extent for us because we more or less expect it to upload it and have it buried by the time it's processed not thinking anyone would really look at it we don't advertise it honestly we don't even know how you find this stuff but uh it's cool that you do <laughs> um uh, well i guess a, a quick shout out to uh whoever posted us up on uh, joe rogan's website uh and uh to anyone else who may have embedded our videos uh that that uh you know we didn't notice uh so thanks for getting us out there yeah like we're we're definitely surprised in a good way that people dig it um, so we, ha we have a couple of comments here as well. Uh, we have from, what's that, Fast Fastius Badger? Uh, yeah. He says, great show. I'm glad I listened to this during the day because even though you guys weren't trying to be dramatic, I was still spooked as hell from all the accounts. I have to say, I, uh, I love you, man. That, that, that comment was one of my favorites. I was, uh, very happy to hear that someone was actually spooked from this. Um, it, me too, because I, I, I gotta say that, uh, just researching a lot of the, the background, I mean, it, 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 for those of you who've read Hunt for the Skinwalker, um, you know, you may have some of the story, but for those of you who, uh, dug even deeper, you realize that there's, there's, there's layers upon layers to this story, and uh, it, it really is a, a, a truly creepy tale. Oh, it's uh, one of the most fascinating places I can think of, honestly. Uh, one of my favorite of all paranormal stories comes from Skinwalker Ranch. I really, really recommend that book, uh, The Hunt for the Skinwalker, for anyone who's found this interesting. Now we have from Never Given 615... He says, my grandfather actually told me about this place when I was younger. He dated a Navajo girl and went to Utah uh, with her and met her family. Being he was Cherokee and her Nava. Um, so it looks like that either the comment was posted before it was actually finished being typed or it was cut off. But uh, um, We appreciate the effort. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, oh, here he is again. So... He was cut off. Sorry I didn't realize that I was cut off. Uh, but being he was Cherokee and her in Na Nava, uh, her family was actually okay with him being together. They told him about all this stuff about seeing the lights and the hyena thing he said was actually um, he had seen once while he and his girlfriend, dad, were out walking to feed their horses. Anyway, it's just nice to see that my grandfather wasn't crazy. Well, of course, he, he wasn't crazy. These are um, well-documented stories. And in fact, uh, like I said, you'll see many, many tales in that book. Uh, they they also have a website. I've 
come across before. I'm sure if you just Google Skinwalker Ranch, you'll come across it. And there is a, a forum, and of course, uh, many people who have had experiences will have many stories that you can read. So that that might give you some comfort there. Uh, moving on, <laughs> we have our, our next video, Extreme Paranormal. This is part two of the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, I believe oh, we've fuck, we did this one. Side. My bad. Okay, precognition, pulsating lights, and foggy cemeteries. So here, here was an actually an, an interesting comment uh, from Ali Matrix. He says, I have dreams, or her, sorry. Uh, he or she says, I have dreams in color like watching TV. I've had a couple come true that were almost 100% true. One was about a pregnant. Okay, it must be a woman. One was about a pregnancy and one about a car wreck. Everything was exact in the dream except for two small details. Bed sheets were different color in the dream, and in uh, in the wreck, or in the wreck dream. Sorry, I never saw the passenger face, but when I said who I thought it was, the man who was there had exact the exact hair color, and the cut of the man was actually there. It's got to the point where her friends actually call her and ask if she's dreamt of them. Um, and I and I know what you're getting at there because you know I I mentioned a couple of these things in the episodes. Uh, particularly, you know, a lot of people mention when they have dreams, they're in black and white. In fact, it's often displayed that way on TV, if, uh, if you've noticed. In indeed. Now, it's interesting because I've uh, I've read by different dream researchers and, and the such that um, they believe that all people actually dream in color, but only some people forget that their dream was in color and remember it in black and white. That, that's um, a strange uh, concept. I wonder why. It must be chemical. Um, well, I guess it's, it's it's like personally, I don't remember my dreams ever. So maybe people only uh, half remember their dreams and remember it so incompletely that they re reconstruct the memory uh, in black and white. Well, I, I can confirm that I dream in color. Uh, as do I. Uh, when the the odd occasion when I do remember a dream. And, you know, I've, exactly what this episode was about, I've had several dreams where, uh, precognitive, I guess, and that what I dreamt had hap happened shortly thereafter. So, it, it, it is an interesting thing. Um, it, it does happen to, you know, there, there's a group of people that it does happen to. It's just not that common. Uh, so, moving on now, we're at our, our chemtrail in, chemtrails in Calgary, Alberta. So this this was an episode I believe uh, is close close to Ryan in particular. Uh, actually, this was not. Uh, um, I, I it wasn't actually a episode that we done. It was uh, oh, just a short right. video that uh, I had taken on my cell phone uh, while I was outside my place of employment, and uh, thought I'd just uh, send it in to Will and get him to post it up on the site, as I thought it was a an excellent example of. Um, what sometimes referred to as a chemtrail or uh, aerosol geoengineering for those of you uh, who look into this kind of stuff a little deeper. Yes, uh, my bad. I, I didn't actually look at the video, just the title. Um, and I know I know we'd done an episode on chemtrails. But yep. any, anyway, um, well, you, you can do this one, Ryan. Uh, so uh, we have Change the Current, uh, who posted... Chemtrails cause greenhouse effect. Uh, when you cover the sky with particulate, it causes a greenhouse effect, which causes accelerated global warming. This will cause many dramatic Earth changes to happen in a very short period of time due to post-galactic rebound. Glacial. Or glacial, sorry. Uh, I'm reading the screen from quite a far away, so to, but please bear with me. Uh, while they wait for the north... Uh, to melt, we suffer from the toxic fallout and dramatic change in the environment now, and we'll see a dramatic population reduction amongst the life. Um, they are psychopaths or sociopaths. Uh, well, um, what do you think about that, Will? Uh, he, he's actually, he sounds right on the money to me. Um, you know, th this is not a, a new topic. I mean, if you, if you even search in YouTube chemtrails, you're going to come across many, many uh, videos and documentaries on the subject. I mean, we, we all kind of know what's going on to some extent. We just, what can you do? 
Well, I think it's uh, interesting to know that people would argue the point, well, if you're spraying stuff in the atmosphere, aren't you uh, creating a uh, warmer blanket uh, to keep the heat in? Well, um, depending, I guess, exactly on what they're spraying, if they're spraying or what what we think they're spraying is uh, barium dust, aluminum dust, uh, highly reflective or refractive materials uh, that they're spraying high, high, high altitudes that are being suspended over long periods of time. Um, and this can have a dramatic effect on what's called the, um, I believe, the albedo effect, um, which is our planet or the at- our atmosphere's ability to uh, redirect sunlight away from the planet um, before it even really gets a chance to enter the atmosphere. Uh, so if that's what's happening here, then uh, we could very certainly begin uh, to see a reduction in temperatures as um, if you look at uh, major publications out there by certain scientific journals, they do say that airborne uh, aerosols uh, have been on a dramatic uprise uh, over the last couple of years. Who knows, perhaps this uh, could have a dramatic effect on the albedo of the of the planet i believe i'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly i'm not a, a planetary scientist <laughs> um but yeah thanks for the comment uh, i guess we'll move on to uh audio anomalies yes so th- this was one um i i think this is the one where i talked about us um in particular when we were at my house and we had recorded a blank file do you remember like, i do that, remember and we heard that yeah the weird stuff so from pool pig um we have uh, if you still have it you should put it through one of those programs to see where or if it will register onto the spectrum of sound like an e- evp and i i know what you're talking about there pool pig um i have a couple of tools in my uh cubase program that allows you to see the the frequency spectrum of an audio file, I'll, I'll admit I didn't actually try that at the time, but I believe though the the significant factor with that is that we didn't actually have a any audio. Well, well that's 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 what I was gonna say is that that's what kind of made it significant. Like if if you record it even an imp, like you know you just recorded the the dead air of the room, you still have a file. It might it might sound almost like there's nothing there. You might have a little hiss, background noise, or whatever. But, uh, you know, you have something. Uh, the significance here was that it was exactly dead. It, it, it's as if you didn't record it, but you had a little rectangle there saying, like, it was, it was like it created an empty file with nothing on it. Yeah. There, there was nothing there at all. So there, there would be nothing to analyze. Um, it was definitely, definitely uh, a strange... An str- audio anomaly. <laughs> exactly. An audio anomaly. Okay, so... Uh, then we have from Terry Yazzie, what happened to the subject of audio anomalies seemed to have ventured off the subject. You're right. I apologize. We do that all the time. Um, again, we're not reading from a teleprompter. I mean, really, the, it's almost kind of like one of our conversations on the phone, except we're somewhat aware and make make a point of addressing you guys as if you're listening. <laughs> um but uh, I'd like to also point out, it looks like, I believe that Pool Pig uh, uh, has commented on several of our videos here. Uh, so, hey, thanks for uh, sticking it out and uh, and putting up a couple of comments. Um, you remember that you can always send uh, stories or, or, or any kind of a comment directly to us uh, at ryan at com Or will at com And, of course... You know, I mean, we we really do appreciate, especially the uh, the serious comments, no matter what it is, because I mean, when we started this show, it, it the idea was that, you know, we we, we weren't going to be going and researching all this stuff and and just regurgitating it. It was more or less you guys were going to be giving us the stories, and we were just going to present it. I mean, and talk about it, and, and possibly interview some of the people that had submitted stories. We're not quite there yet, but uh, we have some stuff, so that's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, that that's it for our comments right now, but that's not it for what we have from the fans because we actually have... I have a story here I'm going to read you guys, and we'll do a little discussion on. Um, we're going to use an alias, though, because I'm not sure if he wanted to use his real name or not, so we're going to call him John. Um and after that, of course, uh, we'll get into the Baltic Sea UFO, which again, 
was a topic suggested by Dane Merck. Quickly. With all of that said, uh, we're going to take a quick break here. I'll play, what should I play? I'll play you guys in tongues from my ethereal album, after which we'll go over uh, the story sent in. Uh, I'm going to use an alias here. We're going to call him John because I'm not sure if he wanted us to use his actual name. And uh, is is a very, very messed up story. It fits our theme quite well, I think. Did you check to make sure his real name wasn't John? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, I know his real name. I just, I don't know if he wants me to use it. So we'll use that alias. And after which we will jump into the exciting topic of the Baltic Sea UFO, which was uh, suggested and recommended to us by one of our listeners, Dane Merck. Uh, so thanks, Dane, for that. It was an interesting read, and uh, we hope that we have enough here to, to satisfy what you wanted. So uh, we'll be back shortly. I hope you enjoyed the tune. All my life I've been blind to you Look in vain for some signs from You know that something's there There's something bright for me I need to know why you have chosen now to To end my life
It may seem selfish and unfair to you But to show you what you can't understand Will just get you running from me Certainly would not be be fair to me. Okay, and we are back, and we have an interesting, if not fucked up, story for you guys. It was, it was kind of spooky, actually. Well, I thought it was kind of spooky. And again, this was uh, an, it's an alias, but it was sent him by John. That's what we're going to call him. So, let's see here. All right, so this is a user-submitted story. It was submitted not too long ago. Um, so I'm just going to go with, you know, I, I put together a, what I could of this. Like He kind of sent a story over a couple or a few different emails, and it was a little hard to follow, so... I put together everything that he wrote and how I thought he meant this to be. And as as intelligibly as we could possibly do it. Um, I guess we can preface this uh, uh, at first with saying, um, you know, if we had a, a, a huge plethora of uh, stories coming in um, and we, we, we really being picky and choosy... Um, I don't know if this uh, if this one would have made the cut, but since it's the only story that anybody has submitted, uh, we've done our best to put it together. Uh, not saying there's not an interesting story, just that uh, it could have been uh, put together in a more coherent fashion and sent to us. Uh, so we're going to do our best to uh, relay the story to you as, as we understand it, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it as much as we enjoyed it. Okay, yeah, so... Uh, I'll just start with, I kind of summarize it here, how he had it wrote. So, John was attending Wick Elementary School in Romulus, Michigan at the time, and this was either 1976 or 1977, and he was in the second grade at the time. So anyway, one day at school, a child was out of his seat uh, when they were all supposed to be sitting, and John got up to play with this kid when he saw him running around, and uh, he was told to sit down, so... You know, naturally, John figured that the teacher was playing favorites because this one kid was for some reason allowed to walk around and play while everyone else had to sit. And I think we've all kind of seen that stuff growing up. That's pretty... Pretty par for the course, I think. Yeah, so in in any case, John didn't know if this was related or not, but he just kind of tucked this in here in his notes, and he said that uh, some of the strange things would happen to his teacher, like objects somehow ending up inside her unexplainably, such as, like pencils and other school supplies which apparently showed up on x-rays um and this this was after that time and again like i I don't really know how it fits but it's an interesting detail i guess but anyway uh back to the main story one day that that kid that was always up kind of running around uh kind of like the teacher's pet he walked up to john and uh like while everyone was sitting down and he tried to stab him in the eye with his pencil uh of course he missed so the kid, after this, the kid started walking around John, circling him. As John said, it was as if he was about to do something evil. And when he got so close, something just crushed him. Actually, his first email uh, explained it as it pureed him. Um, John explained this is, is more than just crushed. He said the kid was just destroyed completely, except that his eyeballs was laying on top of this seemingly liquefied remains. A few minutes after this had happened, the teacher was out looking for that kid when she came by John, and he pointed to the remains and said, you know, you know, this this is that kid. And, and the teacher was like, no, that's just puke. But then John insisted that, no, look, and he pointed to the eyeballs on top of the, uh, you know, the mess and apparently the teacher was freaked out, I guess, as you would be, and a bunch of people showed up, etc. John said that there were uh, men dressed in black suits that hung out there for, for days after this, and there was this one kid who was nearby who kept hearing voices, and he said that he heard a voice say, the child was destroyed properly. 
and that the entity which crushed the child had a license that allowed it to do this. And uh, <laughs> I, I guess you, you could see, like, it's, it's kind of hard to relay this story, but in any case, moving on, uh, John then sent me another email expanding on that story, and he said that his mom and his brother then moved to Belleville, Michigan not long after. John then attended Quirt Elementary School, which he said is no longer there. Uh, while he was there, he said these Air Force men would show up sometimes and that there was a way that they knew something was going to happen. I guess like premonition or maybe they had inside intelligence. Uh, they would ask John questions when things would happen, and they claimed that they knew the monster. I'm not really sure what he meant by that, but I think he's referring to the entity that crushed the kid from that I was talking about just a little earlier. Anyway, one day at school, when it was time to leave, the Air Force guys wanted John to stay. Uh, you know, they talked for a long time, and it was far into the night when the Air Force guys were communicating with some kind of entity. The entity showed them how it could crush things, so I guess it, it must have been that entity. Uh, one Air Force guy gave math coordinates, coordinates to the entity that was half an inch too far into the floor, which resulted in seismic activity and radio communication. John said he thought the Air Force guys were communicating with England and uh, had asked what the radius of the weapon that was just fired. So I'm just, I kind of got like a summary of what I think he meant by this. And that is, uh, the story had quite a few parts that were hard to follow and make sense out of. So I've explained as best as I could how he had it wrote, but I think the summary here is that John had encountered some kind of entity that had the ability to crush things, uh, such as the child from the start of the story. Somehow that entity got attached to John or followed him or something, and I think there, uh, there were government or military people hired to keep tabs on it. Like, I don't think that the people he referred to as Air Force guys were actually Air Force guys. Like, uh, they don't, as far as I know, have any any kind of connection to paranormal stuff and to me it sounds more like a like a cover that you would you know believable to a kid I guess right um, but I think that they you know if this did happen it would have been government agents that follow these kinds of things um, and anyway ha however you look at it it's, it's a pretty messed up story uh, I think that uh, it definitely uh, uh, qualifies as an effed up story for sure. Um, now, I will say that uh, d despite the let's say the the wildness of the story uh, and the somewhat fragmented. Uh, way the story was sent to us uh i did attempt to do uh, uh as as much research on it as i possibly could um now i did uh verify that there there was a <clears throat> individual um of this name or with the name john's real name and he did live in the area he said he lived in uh and there was a school nearby with that name um however i don't believe that the school is actually tore down i think it's actually still an operation or there's another school in the area under the same name now uh, however, I, I went back and looked as, as much as I could, um, even so far into uh, uh, mortuary uh, uh, databases that sometimes give you some information. However, I could find absolutely nothing about any anomalous deaths uh, of, of any children. Um, now, I guess if this was a, a hit done by a... Uh, um, advanced entity uh, perhaps information about such a such a death would have been scrubbed from the papers long ago uh, perhaps long before the internet was ever even invented um, but I guess it, it's it's up to the up to the reader uh, to or the listener uh, to decide uh, what they think of, of, of such a tale um, I guess if there's anybody who remembers anything uh, about such a story who may have been around that area around that time feel free to give us a, a an email or put up a comment on on the site uh um, we 
we'd we'd love more information. But uh, I guess other than that, that's uh, that's all we can all we can really say is that it's definitely an effed up story. It is that, and we appreciate it. Um, so now we're going to move on to the meat of this conversa- or this show, which is the Baltic Sea UFO. Uh, yeah. And, um, and again, this, this was a topic sent in by uh, one of our listeners, Dane Merck. Uh, thanks for sending that in, Dane. Um, so first of all, this is a recent event. This is not something that happened a long time ago. It was only last summer, in fact. Uh, so summer 2011 when Swedish marine explorers had discovered something strange by chance. Excuse me. Uh, Anyway, basically their their sonar showed a pattern at the bottom of the sea in which was described to look like, and I quote, it bared an uncanny resemblance to the Star Wars fabled Millennium Falcon, unquote. Uh, Swedish divers formed a team called the Ocean X Team. So the, these were the, the guys who actually went down to uh, on an expedition. So they went on an expedition towards this area, and they found the actual site uh, was like a perfect circle, and that mainstream uh, press outlets, like, you know, as, as soon as they found this, the mainstream press quickly kind of claimed it to be a UFO landing site, and that, that's why it has the name now, the Baltic Sea UFO. Um, that said, you know, scientists and others have said that the formation, though odd, is natural and to be made of stone, therefore cannot be a UFO. Because as we all know, UFOs are not made of stone or at least any UFOs that we have ever um, found or has been documented. But that, that's more, more or less just an overview. Um, let, let, let's outline some of the uh, key details here. And this... this these details I took from an article by Eddie Wren that I found on the internet. Um, well, actually, I didn't find it. Dane Merck uh, sent me the link. Uh, so the Swedes found something strange on their sonar. Uh, they go on an expedition to investigate, and they find an object that is raised about 10 to 13 feet above the seabed and curved at the sides like a mushroom. You know, there's a hole which is surrounded by a strange rock formation that the expedition team, you know, they can't explain it. Uh, there are stones covered in something resembling soot, and I'm guessing this is the black material between cracks that the previous article I read um, were talking about. And of course, you know, the experts don't know what it is. No one really has an answer for it. You know, but my favorite detail of this whole story, actually, and the most mysterious to me, is the fact that when divers got within 200 meters of this object, it shuts off their electrical equipment, such as phones and cameras, uh, and, they, and they tested this by swimming back and forth, uh, you know, to and away from this formation, and they quoted it as around the 200 meter mark in which, you know, the, the electrical shutdown happens. You know, and some of the other details that I found strange were that the team had found a 985-foot trail, which looked like, and I quote, a runway, like like as if a plain runway that is flattened at the seabed, and at the end of this runway is this strange object. So, I mean, what, what do you make of that, Ryan? Um, <clears throat> well, I've been following this story for a while, of course. This is something that is currently still ongoing. Uh, if you check the uh, Ocean X, the Team Ocean X uh, website, uh, I believe the last uh, update was on July 17th of this year. Um, so, from what I can tell from the uh, from from the sonar data and, and the information that's been published so far, that it appears that a that a uh, a circular object, um, an irregularly shaped kind of circular object uh, appears right at the end of this this long he said 900 meter 985 yeah uh, a tray uh well what some people are saying a runway um which also has been described as as perhaps um the the uh, waped out seabed wreckage that was left behind after this thing crashed into the into the seabed and continued on for uh, quite a while before a skid it to a stop. Um, now, if if we are looking at a downed uh, uh, aircraft of some sort, uh, that would be consistent with a with an aircraft uh, crash. Um, now, 
nothing that we have uh, that I know of is disc shaped. Uh, is disc disc shaped, uh, nor uh, would it. I, I don't believe it would survive impact with the water in such a uh, to such a degree where it would uh, or have the momentum uh, to carry it so far along the seabed. Uh, so if this is in case, it, it is indeed a, a metallic object. Uh, perhaps um, it's been down there for so long that is encrusted with mil- mineralization, uh, kind of looks stony, covered in sand and uh, barnacles and everything. Um, there are photographs on the internet that have been taken using ROVs, uh, which I find interesting because the claim from the Ocean X team was that uh, any electronic equipment that got too close would shut down. Uh, so within 200 meters, within though. 200 meters. So perhaps the photographs were taken from further away with ROV. I'm not really privy to the detail, but if you know, if we just really break down the site and look at the site, um, there are artistic renditions of of the um, the sonar uh, uh, data, and and for anybody who looks at the the data, even the untrained eye, it it certainly does look like an object has entered the water and created a, a swath of destruction along the seabed. And if you really, you know, I'm, again, I'm not a mathematician or an aerodynamicist. Um, but if you, you know, really sat down and thought about it for a minute, uh, if you had something that, that left a scar on the seabed that long, uh, it must have been traveling uh, pretty quick. Um, and, and it must be a re- relatively sturdy device to have uh, survived impact uh, into the water and across the seabed like that. Well, have you, have you seen the actual sonar image from the first expedition? I have indeed, yeah. Like, I, I've seen it myself, and... You know, it really does look like the Millennium Falcon. If you look at them side by side, it does. So it definitely does not look natural. I mean, that that's right off the cuff. I mean, the first thing you think when you look at it is that's man-made or some intelligently... It, do- it definitely does look like an intelligently designed... Um structure of some kind uh uh i mean for all i know it's a it, it's a building that's that's down there um but for for the team that's investigating this thing they thought that as soon as they went down there they would conclusively come back with uh, yep natural uh, structure just a just a anomalous rock structure all the all the investigators involved uh, pretty much said yeah we, we we fully expect just to find a, a very benign uh, stone structure at the seabed um, but apparently it, every time they go down there's there's they come back with more questions than answers yeah and you know I uh, you know the first thing I thought of when they like because again the most interesting detail to me is that electrical interference right now that's a you know electrical interference has been an interesting uh, theme over the last Five or six years. Well, it's especially uh, especially con- uh, consistent with UFO stories. Um, you you have of course uh, UFOs that hover over vehicles. The vehicles shut down. People's phones and radios cease working. The lights in their homes go out. Um, so there 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 has been quite a bit of uh, of, of of I guess antidotes anyway stories that uh, from witnesses um, related to this kind of thing. Um, and you know, again, you know, in the was it in the Antarctic, uh, 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 they have discovered some sort of enormous magnetic anomaly down there. So this reoccurrence of of submerged magnetic anomalies seems to have been popping up quite a bit lately. And I think it's something that definitely warrants a uh, 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 pro- you know a funded search because, as far as I understand, the uh, the Ocean X team. Um, I believe they're just they're they're they are not an organization. They are a, a group of uh, open, like-minded individuals uh, who have backgrounds in in, in science or uh, oceanic uh, sciences. Um, they've come together to try to ferret out this little mystery. Um, so I guess for any of you out there who's who looking to uh, uh, support this cause, you can always run over to their website. I'm sure they have a donate button somewhere. Oh, for sure. Um, <laughs> you know, and like. I, I actually, you know, the first thing I thought of when you talk about magnetic or electrical interference, I thought of magnetism, right? Because magnetism goes with that. And so then I started thinking, you know, there's rocks with magnetism. 
right? Magnetite. Magnetite, there you go. Well, I, I ended up doing a little looking on the internet, because I'm not a geologist it's not, or a mineralist or whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, yeah, that. so anyway, I, I I went and looked at all these different rocks, and, you know, I, I on Wikipedia and various different uh, geology sites and stuff like that just to get a an idea of, you know, whether whether or not this would be possible. And, you know, I found that there's different kinds of rocks that are magnetic. Um, you know, there, there's a f- various different types, actually, but they don't all retain a charge. Uh, the most magnetic rocks uh, contain magnetite, as Ryan mentioned. And magnetite occurs in rocks such as sandstones, granites, and metamorphic rocks. Uh, however, that being said, I couldn't find any examples of a natural rock magnetism that would be so strong that at 200 meters, you know, that it could actually cause such a, an electrical disruption. Well, for anybody who, you know, knows anything about um, uh, magnetic fields and, the, um, you know, an electromagnetic field, just a magnetic field can be tremendously strong. Uh, however, these types of fields generally do not uh, extend too far away from the magnetic object that uh, um, is, you know, in question. And, uh, you know, I'm even at the moment, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at images of uh, sonar image uh, that has been rendered in almost a top down isometric view. And uh, I, I really do have to say that to the untrained eye, it certainly does look like a, a, a physical object uh, of a non-natural, uh, intelligently designed object, at the end of what can only be described as a, you know, as a, as, as a, as a, 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 a gorge has been well, cut like into a, the like sea Like a floor. slope runway, it almost looks as if it hit, and the farther it dragged, you know, the farther it dragged with its momentum, the deeper it got into the seabed. We exactly, we have an object that appears to have sunken into the seabed, perhaps partially covered with with. Uh, you know, silt and detritus from the sea. Um, you know, I guess with with something like this, only time is going to tell. Uh, but it, it, it's truly interesting that in this, you know, uh, we're 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 2012. Uh, you know, the 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 be all year for conspiracy uh, theorists and and paranormal lovers all over the world. Uh, because and, everybody believes the world's going to end. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know if everybody believes the world's going to end, but people uh, people certainly believe that uh, 2012 is significant. Yes. Um, whether that it's significant for you because you believe that zombies are going to attack, or that the mothership's coming back to get you, um, or that the government is uh, going to hit a button and kill us all. Um, well, geez, you know the the zombie attack thing is something we could do a whole episode on, since there's like uh, dozens of. You know, examples of this now after hitting the news, which has initially all been blamed on bath salts, but have been proven to be not bath salts. <laughs> you know? Um, so, I, I guess, you know, for myself, um, I remain, I definitely remain hopeful. Um, I know that this team in particular has uh, traveled several times to the site, like I said earlier. And it seems like they're only bringing back more and more questions. Uh, well, see, the the last article I read, um, you know, the article was written as recent as June 28, 2012. So, I mean, that's, that's like not even a full month ago yet. And it talks about the Ocean Access team return trip to see the object. And they managed to get a 3D sonar picture of the object. And I've actually personally seen um, the picture that they came back with. And the picture reveals the object to have right angles, walls with perfectly smooth surfaces, and what appears to be corridors or something that appears to be similar to like a, a staircase. Now that that that's not natural. It certainly is not. <laughs> you know, and so I mean, let, let's just look at this in a nutshell and point out, like in bullet points here, what what this what we have so far. We have an object that has a circular plate-like exterior. Not unlike that of a UFO. I mean, I think we can all agree that that's the staple of a UFO shape. A circular disc-like object or oval. It is, you know, this this shape is 180 meters in circumference. Uh, The object 
is 200 feet across and it is mushroom shaped and has a pillar which extends out of the seabed about 8 meters and has a 4 meter thick dome on top which is also mushroom shaped. The so whole for those of you who don't know uh, meters, uh, just uh, multiply everything by 3. Now I don't even know that so that's good <laughs> advice. Or uh, divide it by 3, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that would have been the, the exact... Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, the whole object is about 40 feet or 12 meters high above the uh, seabed. And if any of this is fucked up, I took it off the internet. Let's let's blame those guys. <laughs> um, anyway, there's apparently a, a... Jesus, what did I put there? There's a hole on top of the object, approximately 25 centimeters in diameter. People, uh, nobody really knows what it's for or where it leads, just that they feel it's significant for some reason. Um, I, well, I've actually seen a couple of uh, what appear to be ROV uh, photographs that were taken of the, the very top uh, of this, this object. Now, I know that close by, there was what looked to be like a, a circular mound of rocks and some what, what to all appearances looked like charcoal, uh, which... Seems to make no sense whatsoever because this thing's underwater. But I guess if it had crashed there uh, when the water was low, or perhaps or we're really not seeing what 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 this uh, what this thing is. But the 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 point being, I guess, is that the 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 hatch uh, or the the hole in the very top of the object looks like a, a hatch of sorts. Um, so I guess you know between the 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 descriptions that we have with the three dimensional radar, at least could give us a little comfort that whatever built this uh, at least has legs because there were stairs. Uh, the hatch isn't very big, so we're not talking about giant aliens. Um, so I guess the possibility always remains that uh, it was a a experiment experimental craft built by humans. Um, now how how big would twenty five centimeters in diameter be? Uh, twenty five centimeters in diameter. It sounds uh, stupid, right? Because it's exactly twenty five centimeters in diameter. I'm more or less expecting you to raise your hand, so I get it. Um, so you know what what you're looking at is uh, what you got you got uh, uh, twenty uh, thirty centimeters in a foot. Um, you know and and. So for for those of you who uh, who don't know, again don't know uh, uh, centimeters like um, me, <laughs> there's 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 thirty centimeters in a foot and I guess twelve inches in a foot. So you could uh, you can kind of get an idea. So it's about a it's about a a, a, a man sized hole. Uh, okay, so so we're looking at okay, so it's plausible that it could be like for a human to get in and out of, or perhaps an alien. Uh, if it is an extraterrestrial, uh, I, I guess we're we're expecting this would be at least a anthropomorphic uh, alien, uh, um, meaning that it would have a somewhat man, uh, a human-like shape, uh, considering that there's stairs and hallways and hatches. Um, and I guess the possibility always remains that uh, this could be a experimental uh, a submarine of sorts. That's true. Um, China and and Russia are rarely open with uh, the United States or other countries on uh, their you know secret naval programs, as I'm sure the United States is, and Canada and other countries aren't very open with one another about their secret naval programs. So again, we could be looking at the uh, the uh, uh, remains of a of an experimental uh, uh, Nazi submarine, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, perhaps we have some uh, uh, surviving members of the uh, of the Third Reich uh, playing cards at the bottom of the sea. Uh, that's an odd picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, that having been said, we got two, there's two trips down there since, I believe, since the, the initial one. And they've evidently raised more questions than answers. Um, and, you know, one of these things, uh, I got to say, this one kind of blew my top a little bit, I think. And that is that um, the Ocean X team managed to find yet another anomaly, which was about 200 meters away from the initial one. And this one hasn't been explored yet. Uh, however, they, they do have the first side scan sonar images. And they show something that is 
shape similar to that of, and I quote, Gothic church window. Now, what could you? What? Where could you even go with that? Um, I well, I guess the the most obvious direction would be a uh, sunken structure of some sort. Um, but again, uh, I guess as far as 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 this new anomaly is concerned, we have uh, very very on. little little data. Um, I guess, if for that matter, it could be a a, a the tail fin off of this uh, Baltic Sea UFO that snapped off and yeah, sticking well, out of the dirt. You know, the the team believes that it's possible that you know whatever is at this new site could answer some questions of the initial site. But I just found it interesting anyway that you know for it to be shaped like a Gothic church window. I, I, it is an interesting way to describe it anyway. You know, <laughs> um, it's not an object. I guess you would you would t- t- expect to see lying on the bottom of of the ocean. I, I guess it goes to to illustrate the uh, the peculiarity of the image that they that they got back. Um, and you know what's what's the chances uh, in 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 the vastness of the ocean, uh, of which we've explored less than the surface of our moon. Um, that we would have f- bumped into two uh, unrelated, uh, sto- you know, anomalous stone formations that 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 seem to have no other, um, you know, a- a- amalgam anywhere nearby. It's not like this is a a a a, a single or a an anomalous stone structure amidst a a range of stones. We're looking at an object that's sitting in 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 just the sand at the bottom of the ocean. It's at the end of a, a giant skid mark. Um, <laughs> I took that the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> and, um. and, and so, and then not not two hundred meters away, there's a another object that looks like a a, a Gothic cathedral uh, window. Well, you know the the first thing that came to my mind, me being me, you know, you're at the bottom of the of the sea here, and you got a Gothic church window. I'm thinking H.P. Lovecraft, right? Hey, oh, uh, the city, <laughs> you know? the sunken city of Relay. Uh, uh, I'm thinking Cthulhu. I'm thinking uh, all, Dagon. All, yeah, you know, I know it's not real, but goddamn, wouldn't it be interesting if it was? <laughs> well, I guess that's a uh, that, that could be a topic for another show. The 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 great bloop. That was recorded. Uh, oh yes, back in 1999, I believe, or too early 2000. I uh, vaguely remember that. I, I've read and watched so many things now. I've probably pushed that out of my brain. I can only fit so much, you know. Um, so uh, again, you know, we're 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 dealing with a a a, a another effed up story. Um, a truly an a, an object that is is for all intents and purposes uh, anomalous. The 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 Baltic Sea anomaly, uh, I guess for now re- remains as such. Um, and until uh, either they get some more funding or those guys light a fire under their ass and haul this thing up, uh, it's going to be a mystery for a little while longer. But luckily, they're still going on expeditions even to right now. So I mean. Perhaps in the not so distant future, we may have some answers. But you know, I wouldn't hold your breath. We never get any answers. But that's what makes this stuff so fun. Right? Uh, well, it, it, if 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 they answer the questions for us, uh, we wouldn't have a show. We wouldn't have a show. <laughs> so fuck it. Let, let, let's never find anything out. Let's stay in the dark. Nah, Conjecture just, forever. And just give us the illusion that we're making progress. That's all we need. Makes us feel good, right? Uh, I think you nailed what they think on the head. <laughs> okay. Well, with that having been said, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for sticking with us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thanks for, you know, th- this whole episode was fueled by you guys. You know, we had fan story, fan topic, comments. Let's do this some more. Let's give us less work. Give us more shit to talk about so we don't have to find it. That's what we like. That's that's what we always intended. We're lazy men. Give us more. Um, well, I mean, this show is about the viewer. So uh, by by viewer consent, we are here. Um, your your topics, your suggestions. Uh, it, it's that that is that's that's the direction the show is going to go in. Uh, so again, please uh, um, pour it on. Yeah. So with that said, I'm Will Pender, and I'm Ryan Sharp. 
Don't forget to, uh, if you have stories, videos, questions, comments, concerns, topics, send it to will at fduppstories.com. Yes, dot com. And uh, Ryan at fduppstories.com. And that's it. Have a good one. Thank you.